In this video, we're going to go through the process of a two-way ANOVA F-test all the way from beginning to end, um, going through the five-step process for a hypothesis test. So this was a randomized experiment with a balanced full factorial design and it measured weight gain in grams of male rats under four diets. So they varied the source of protein, either beef or cereal, and the level of protein, either high or low. So this is a two-way ANOVA. So we've got two explanatory variables and they're both categorical. Um, we have the level of protein and we also have the source of protein. So sometimes in cases like this where we have two explanatory variables categorical explanatory variables um, that are both randomly assigned, we sometimes call those factors. So this could be like a two-factor design. The treatments are the combinations of the factors. So every combination of level and source. So we had beef and cereal were our two types of um, protein, our two sources of protein. And then each of those has two levels. So we have beef high, and beef low, cereal high, and cereal low. So notice that this was called a full factorial design. Full factorial just means that you have all possible combinations of the factors. So we've got, each factor has two levels, we've got all possible combinations represented here. And then the number of replications, that's just a word for the number of observational units per treatment. So in this case, we have 10 rats per diet. And notice that this says it's a balanced design. Balance just means that the number of replications is the same for all of the treatments. So checking our assumptions is going to be basically the same as it would be for a one-way ANOVA, and we're treating the treatments as the groups. So those combinations, beef low, beef high, cereal low, cereal high, those are our four groups, and we're going to use those as we check the conditions. So we've got a quantitative response variable with two categorical explanatory variables. So a two-way ANOVA is appropriate. We've got independent random samples coming from a randomized experiment. And later on, we'll talk about how things are different when you don't have a randomized experiment. It turns out a little bit different in a two-way ANOVA. Um, we need approximately normal population distributions for each group, but remember the larger the sample, the more skew and outliers we can tolerate. So it's kind of a balancing act between the shape and the sample size. And in this example, we have fairly small sample sizes, so we only have um, 10 rats per diet. And remember, it's the sample size in each group, not the overall sample size that we care about. Uh, but I actually think that the condition is met here because looking at the graph, I don't see any strong skew um, or outliers. So I think it's reasonable to assume that this condition is met. And by the way, let me take a second and show you how I made that graph and jump if you wanted to see um, it broken down by two different factors. So I'm just going to use the graph builder like usual, and I'll put weight gain on the x-axis. And if you use the y-axis here on the left, you can only put one categorical variable there. So I'm going to use the group y on the other side. So I'm going to drag level over here. And then beyond that, I want to break it down by source. So I'm going to take source and drag it kind of to this little triangle up here at the top. And now you can see it's broken down by source first, and then within that, it's broken down by level. And you can always add box plots. If you want both the dots and the box plots at the same time, you can just drag the dots down. Um, or you could do a histogram if that makes it easier to see. The last condition is that the population distributions need to have the same standard deviation. So again, the F statistic is pretty robust, so it doesn't have to be perfect. A rule of thumb is that the largest standard deviation needs to be less than twice the smallest standard deviation. And this is even less important when the sample sizes are equal, like we have here, these balanced groups. Um, but I'll go ahead and check it. So first, just looking at the um, graph, I can already tell that they're gonna be very similar. It looks like the spread is very similar in each group. Um, but let me show you how to calculate the numerical values for times when it may not be so obvious. I think the easiest way is to use analyze tabulate. And I usually like to put my response variable in the drop zone for columns, so I'll put that here. And then I want to break it down by both source and level. So I'll start off dragging source. I don't really know what order I'm doing this in, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then you can drag level on either side here, depending on how you want to break it down, what order. 
Okay, so I've got beef low and high, cereal low and high, um, and I don't want the sums, I want the standard deviations. And if I were interested, if I wanted to look at the means too, I could add that to my table. So let's see, the largest is 15.709, and that's much less than twice the smallest, which is 13.887. So just a little reminder here that we'll use Analyze Tabulate to get these um, standard deviations. And we're in good shape because our largest was 15.709, and the smallest was 13.887. Step two, we're gonna test the hypotheses. And we always wanna test for an interaction before testing for main effects. So let's start there. So the null hypothesis will be that there is no interaction Usually it's gonna be no effect, no difference, something like that. Um, so no interaction between our two factors. So in this case, between protein source and protein level. That's our null hypothesis, no interaction. And then the alternative is that there is an interaction. And I'm gonna be lazy and not write the whole thing out again. For calculating the test statistic, we're gonna use a new um, feature in Jump, new to us, um, analyze fit model. So fit model is what you use when you have more than one explanatory variable. Fit y by x kind of imagines that you have just the one response and the one explanatory and that's it. So I'm gonna do analyze fit model and I'm gonna put weight gain in the y box and I'm gonna add source and level down here where it says construct model effects. Um, but I'm still not done. This would be an additive model because it just has source and level. We don't have an interaction term yet. So I'm gonna highlight both of those and then I'm gonna click cross and that's gonna include the interaction term. There's actually a shortcut if you wanna do it all in one step. So you can do weight gain here and then highlight the two. And under macros, there's a thing that says full factorial and that's gonna include source, level, and the interaction. So it's not that big of a deal when you only have two factors, but if you had a design with more factors and including all the interactions would be a little bit of a pain. So this can be kind of helpful. And then we'll click run. And there's a lot of output here. Some of it we'll go over um, later, but to start, you'll find the summary of fit. You've seen that before with the R squared, um, the analysis of variance table that we've been working with the parameter estimates, this is showing us the effects. So this is the effect for source. So beef would be plus 2.35, cereal would be minus 2.35. It doesn't show you the other one because they figure you can um, make it add up to zero and figure it out. Um, for level, it's negative 5.7 for low and it'd be positive 5.7 for high. And then this is the interaction. So it's adjusting for the fact that the effect of source depends on level and vice versa. And then we're also gonna use the effect test. So click the little arrow here and scroll down and you can see the tests for um, the interaction and then also the main effects if you get that far. Okay, so for testing the interaction, we're gonna use the part down here where it says source by level. This is the part for testing the interaction term. So we got our F statistic here of 3.9518 and the p-value that goes with it is 0 0.0545. So for our conclusion, we're gonna to compare to an alpha level. Yours should say 0.1, that's a typo on mine. Um, at the alpha equals 0.1 level, is there sufficient evidence of an interaction? So the answer here would be yes, because our p-value is smaller than that alpha level. So our p-value is 0 0.0545 which is less than alpha equals 0.1. And I think you have more room on your um, page, so if you wanna write out a sentence here, um, you could say we have sufficient evidence of an interaction between protein source and protein level. And in a later activity, you'll think about um, why they might have chosen an alpha of 0.1 as we're testing for the interaction here. Um, obviously, when we set our um, alpha level, we're thinking about type 1 and type 2 errors and how we want to balance those risks. So if you have evidence of an interaction, 
you want to make some kind of graph to see what the interaction looks like. So I'm going to go back to that fit model output and I'm going to scroll all the way over to the right. This is where we've got information about the interaction here where it says source times level. So I'm going to click the little down arrow here and do LS means plot. And I'm going to click the box to create an interaction plot and then choose which one is going to be my overlay. Um, so to match what's in the notes, I'm going to have the source be the overlay. And I don't really like to have these bars, the confidence bars, I feel like make it a little bit harder to see what's going on. Um, so I'm going to get rid of those. And oops, the key's not showing on this one. So the circle is showing um, where the source is beef and the plus sign is showing where the source is cereal. So we're using here source as our overlay. Okay, so what does it mean to say that we have an interaction between source and level? There's sort of two different ways to think about it. One is to say that the effect of the protein level differs based on the source. So let's think about what that means in this particular example. What's the effect of the protein level? Looking at the way this graph is set up, the effect of protein level would be shown by the slope, right? What's the difference between low and high? So if we look at cereal, the difference between low and high seems pretty negligible. Maybe um, it's a little bit higher for the high protein, but it doesn't seem like there's that much of a difference. Whereas when the source is beef, there is a big difference between high and low. So the effect of protein level changes depending on whether you're talking about beef or cereal. The other way that you could say it is in terms of the protein source. So you could say that the effect of protein source differs based on level. So let's describe that a little more carefully here. So protein source, that's whether it's the red or the blue. So if we look at the effect of protein source, it actually changes directions entirely depending on what level it is. So if we look at the low level, um, in that case, cereal is actually higher than beef, whereas when we look at the high level, beef is much higher than cereal. So this can happen sometimes where it completely reverses the direction of the effect based on the other variable. So let's think about these tests here, which would be for the main effects of source and level. It doesn't really make sense to test for them here because when you say you're testing for the source effect, well, what really is the source effect? Because is beef on top or cereal on top? It depends on the level, right? Same sort of thing with what is the level effect? Well, is high and low a big difference? Eh, it depends. It depends on the source. You can't really talk about the level without talking about the source because that's changing the effect. So when you have an interaction like we have here, it doesn't make sense to test the main effects. Instead, we're going to consider it as four separate treatments and look to see how they compare. And we're going to use Tukey's HSD, so it's going to be very similar to what we did with a one-way ANOVA. Let me show you how to get it in jump. So I'm going back over where the interaction is again. And I'm going to click the down arrow for source level. LS means Tukey HSD is one of the options. And it, uh, by default, gives you the information in a table. It also gives you the connecting letters report. If you want to see the ordered differences report, like we did for a one-way ANOVA, um, that's here, and you can just check it. And since this part is very similar to what we did for a one-way ANOVA, I'm going to leave it for you as an activity.